Our lunch and lawn program is sponsored by the Fairfax County Master Gardener Association, which operates under the Virginia Cooperative Extension Program of Virginia's two land grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. The Fairfax County Master Gardeners Association is a nonprofit organization whose volunteers provide research-based horticultural information to home gardeners in all of Fairfax County, Virginia. The Lunch and Lawn Program is a virtual counterpart to the association's home turf program. Until return to our popular in-person turf evaluations, our goal is to continue helping county residents understand how to manage and improve the health of their turf with the equally important long range goal of protecting the Chesapeake Bay watershed from harmful runoff. Our main topic of today's Lunch and Learn program is biochar and other supplements will be, which will be presented by Master Gardener, Terry Bachman. Following Terry's presentations, we will have shorter segments where we will learn about annual bluegrass weevil and corn speedwell. After these presentations, we will address questions submitted from you during registration, and if we have time, we will answer as many questions entered into the chat box. The plan will be to wrap up our program by 1 p.m. Today's session is our sixth segment of our spring 2021 Lunch and Learn program. We choose our spring topics to be timely for the tasks and common turf issues facing homeowners this spring. We hope you can tune in to as many sessions as possible, and we encourage you to please tell your friends and neighbors about our program. All of our sessions are recorded, so if you miss any or simply want to review a topic, they are on the VCE Fairfax YouTube channel referenced in our chat box. You can also find the fall 2020 sessions archived there. Now let's begin our program with Master Gardener Terry for a comprehensive look at, at some lawn supplements. Terry? Thank you, Lauren. And I will start my segment on biochar first by giving a little background and making a major disclaimer or two. Um, first of all, uh, this topic came up for the Lunch and Lawn program uh, as a result of a question submitted from our Watch Our Viewers last fall. And since uh, the group had not re done a lot of research to that, at that point about biochar and its impact on our lawns and our gardens, it was deferred and put on to as a, as a topic for this spring. And, uh, and I was up for taking on this challenge. Um, I had heard a little bit about the buzz of biochar in some of the presentations uh, during our classes as master gardeners. But, um, but, but had not, uh, have never used it myself and have no, and had never done any research, but I happened to be uh, talking about biochar uh, when my daughter, who's a graduate student at Virginia Tech uh, in environmental sciences, uh, uh, perked up and said, well, biochar, that's great for, uh, for water filtration. And so it uh, perked my interest and I, it's been uh, a lot of fun to research this uh, very fascinating topic. But my major disclaimer is that the more I learned, the more I realized I, how much I didn't know. This is an amazingly comp complex topic and it's also a lot of research going on. Um, so uh, I will endeavor to do my best to present this topic uh, to the degree I've, I've, I've researched, uh, but I look forward to us all engaging in conversations and encourage uh, additional research for all uh, participating today. So with that explanation, thank you, <laughs> Roseanne. Um, biochar is a substance derived from organic materials rich in carbon that can be naturally found in the soil, often as deposits resulting from past vegetative fires or can be artificially produced through the process of pyrolysis. So, so basically biochar, if you want to uh, put it in terms of something we're all familiar with, is charcoal because that's the, that is the, one of the most common biochars that we use in 
our everyday existence. However, um, the research I realized in biochar as it relates to the agricultural field, et cetera, can come from all different kinds of biomasses, agricultural waste, municipal solid waste, and all kinds of plant materials from nuts to corns to bamboo, et cetera. So that was one of my biggest aha moments was realizing that biochar products in themselves very enormously just based on what biomass product is used to make it. So what is pyrolysis? Pyrolysis is a thermochemical conversion process in the absence of oxygen. And I know that sounds um, in itself very complicated, but, um, but it's just uh, carbon-based materials being heated at a very high levels, the, the range of temperatures being um, anywhere from 450 degrees to 750 degrees Celsius. Um, it's part of, um, uh, as you can see in the chart, the, it's part of, uh, of, a, of a series of things that happen in thermochemical conversion of a biomass. And what's amazing about the process is charcoal is not the only byproduct. The other two are um, synthetic gas and bio oil. So those are, those are two other energy sources that can be produced from this process. Um, again, pyrolysis doesn't change the original structure of the um, existing or the big or the um, feedstock biomass, but it changes the porosity, it changes the cellular structure. And in the picture I have that I, is on the right hand side, those are macadamia nuts um, that have gone uh, through pyrolysis. So the picture on top, A to B, is what the it looks like. Um, uh, you know, as you would see it, and from C to D is at the cellular level if you were looking at it through a microscope. And what you'll notice there is that, um, is that the biggest difference are the holes. It's the space. It's the porosity. And this uh, gives, um, this gives anything biochar an amazing uh, physical change that adds to its ability uh, to increase sorption. So I learned to sorb, sorb is a verb. I, I, always, I always knew absorb, but to sorb, to take up is, uh, is the verb. And biochar not only has the properties of absorption, which means taking within uh, and throughout, but adsorption, absorption with a D, which means that it, um, it actually, its quality, its characteristic to actually have things attached to its outside. Again, um, this is uh, pretty amazing. So therefore pyrolysis increases both the properties of the biomass to adsorb and absorb, which has enormous potential. Uh, I'm going to um, do, do a call, uh, <coughs> um, call out for a particular article that I read during my uh, shout out, that's what I was looking for. I forgot the word I was looking for. A shout out for a particular article I was I read during my research that was by um, a Mr. Mark Fuchs, and he's a hydrologist uh, with the Department of Ecology's Waste to Fuels Te uh, Technology uh, uh, Center. And this article put the whole process, the thermochemical process of pyrolysis in terms of viewing a campfire. So I know uh, they were throwing up the article and, and the and, and the chat box, and I encourage you to do it because it puts this very technical uh, process in terms of what you can observe in, in your own uh, backyard campfire. Um, so take I recommend taking the time to read this article if you're interested. Okay, um, my bottom line up front, I'm going to talk more about uh, bio, uh, biochar, obviously, as a supplement for your lawn care, but I always like to tell people um, my conclusion or what I need or, or what my thought is up front. And, and the upfront uh, bottom line I have on this is that biochar is amazing, but biochar is not ready for Main Street gardeners. Um, the products vary too much. Uh, what biomass was used to make the biochar can make an enormous difference. And, uh, and then how it's produced can make an enormous difference. 
And the research, um, there's some very exciting uh, research being done, but it's it's um, but not all research has been positive. In fact, there's some research in agricultural fields where the uh, agriculture output actually declined after using uh, biochar, at least in the short term. So um, so it's it's not quite ready. And in Virginia, uh, again, let me talk about specifically Virginia is that um, biochar. Again, it has this porosity, so it helps for so, um, absorption and uh, moisture absorption. Well, in Virginia, we have a lot of clay, so that might not be something we need. So that's one thing to consider. And then the other thing to consider is that biochar, um, it doesn't, um, it breaks down very slowly and, and doesn't um, move through the soil very easily. So if you're incorporating this into your garden, um, it could have, it could have long-term effects and it's not easily to extract it back out. So um, I would encourage anyone who sees this or learns more about it or hears more about biochar, uh, if you're going to use it, just be cautious. Remember, it's a, it'll be an experiment, monitor, uh, and, uh, and but I will end on this on a happy note, which is that um, the potential here for biochar really is in for some of our environmental and ecological um, opportunities. So, so I, I personally find myself uh, very excited about biochar and hope to support efforts and research in biochar. I just can't say that um, it's ready to put on your lawn. Um, so um, stay tuned, biochar has potential. Um, Biochar background history. Biochar is a modern term, but an ancient concept. Uh, doing some research, I've learned that um, in some of the Amazonian uh, soils of, um, in Brazil, there are amazing depths of very rich dark soil uh, that, that is referred to terra preta that research has demonstrated may have been the result of biochar or biochar-esque agriculture um, uh, technology or, or uh, processes as far as 2,500 years ago, uh, because they found this dark territory or this dark soil in areas where there was populations of uh, civilizations. So it is possible. Um, but um, but they're not exactly sure how it went and uh, or or how it was accomplished. Um, so biochar has been an idea product for a long time, even if it's only recently been the hot topic for environmentalists, ecologists, and agricultural and the agricultural industry. So here's some information about modern pyrolysis. Once again. Um, I'm emphasizing the variability here pyro uh, of these technologies and the sophistication of these technologies. Pyrolysis, um, Greek term, or derived, derived from Greek term, pyro for fire and lysis for the separation. Um, I have some pictures here that show that some of the bio, uh, I'm sorry, some of the pyrolysis technology can be as small as something for your campfire or as large as industrial scale. As I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the captured emissions from uh, pyrolysis are synthetic gas and bio oils, both of which can be used for, um, both of which can are potential for new uh, fuel sources, um, uh, new fuel sources. So, um, once again, great variability in biochar products, this time very different because of different technologies that can make the biochar at different uh, temperatures and different purities. Um, to summarize some of the environmental and ecological benefits of biochar. First, uh, from a soil amendment, perspective and that's that's why it probably ended on our agenda for today it it does improve soil uh, both from a physical and it's physical and chemical properties 
uh, improving nutrient uptake, water retention, and minimizing nutrient leaching, which is one of the main reasons that the agricultural industry is very uh, interested in biochar as, um, as the research goes. This, this potential is enormous. Um, from an environmental perspective, carbon sequestration is an amazing uh, capacity that might be, um, uh, you know, the result of biochar technologies. And there is an estimated, as estimated 2.2 gigatons of carbon could be stored in the soil by 2050 using biochar conversion technologies, according to the International Biochar Initiative. So, um, that's pretty an amazing um, capacity. And then, uh, and then let's not forget that creating the biochar is an enormous use for what would otherwise be uh, waste from agriculture or from, as I mentioned before, um, uh, municipal waste systems or, or other animal waste systems. So overall, one of the greatest benefits of uh, biochar is that it could create an overall carbon negative fuel cycle and we are all looking for ways to improve or to positively affect climate change so so um, so that's a that's a big one okay I think I'm going to stop here for a minute and see if anyone has any questions about biochar before I go on to the part of my presentation on other soil supplements And if not, then we shall continue. Thank you very much. Okay, other supplements and why we add them to the soil. So this is your, you know, bread and butter gardening stuff. And we all should be um, to have, um, to have uh, active and uh, garden beds, garden beds and lawns, uh, soil supplements are important. Um, they improve soil structure. They help add soil nutrients. They help increase water retention and drainage. That's what some of that's that's some of the amazing thing. <clears throat> and um, and supplements can be used to adjust soil pH. All of these characteristics are very important because a sound and uh, biodiversified soil is what will make your plants, your lawn, be able to take up nutrients. So supplements feed your soil and then uh, your supplements help your, um, so help your plants take up those nutrients and or be at the right pH to absorb those nutrients. Um, some of the some um, specific supplements, organic matter. Uh, that's our, our most uh, common soil supplement of from uh, a, a, a rich compost or well-rotted well leaves. These things uh, are amended into the soil, will go a far way to making our soils rich for our plants. Other examples based on the needs of your soil and the composition of your particular soil might be uh, sphagnum peat moss for helping water absorption, aged manure, which is high in soil nutrients, uh, earthworm castings, which can help improve soil structure, aeration or anchors for your plants. Um, and I would not be, um, I would, I'd be a, it would not, it, I, at this point, I should remind all of you to make sure you're having your soil test so that you know the situation you're dealing with so that you can get to that. Um, and from your soil test, you can specifically ask for um, the percent of organic matter. So that would be very helpful when you're trying to figure out how much soil amendment your garden or your lawn beds need. Um, now, um, moving on to the pH supplements or supplements that affect pH. Um, obviously, from your soil test, you're going to know that all important pH number, which affects the growth of your lawn. Um, and for Northern Virginia and for most of us who have a cool season turf grass, we also know that our turf grasses are best grown in soil uh, pH that range from 6.0 to 7.2. Um, and our supplements, therefore, are uh, pelletized dolomitic limestone, which will 
raise your pH um, and that, and then, um, and then ammonium sulfite, if you happen to be one of those people who have limed their lawns for too many years, and it does happen, uh, who might need to bring their pH back down, an ammonium sulfite would be the supplement to get your, to get your lawn um, in the right pH range for uh, beneficial uh, grass growth. <clears throat> and so, and these were, now I'm here to my list of references used to uh, put today, put together today's presentation. Thank you so much, Terry. That was a great presentation on biochar. We appreciate the journal that we have over here in our chat box. I don't see any questions from our audience, but I did have a question for you pertaining to applying some of these supplements. Do you have any tips that would be helpful for us? Yeah. Um, well, adding supplements, again, starts with that all-important uh, soil test so you know where you are. But uh, it's also, you know, the, the when and how depends on your situation with your turf. Um, if you're talking about doing an overseeding, which is best done um, at the end of the summer, early fall, um, th that's one thing. Or supplements could be uh, added to your turf uh, at any time if you are preparing your soil for uh, an installation of sod. So, um, uh, in fact, I will mention now that if you want fuller, advi uh, fuller advice on um, adding, uh, doing top dressing or, or for your uh, lawn with these types of uh, compost supplements, that back in August 2020, in session one of the fall 2020 um, lunch and lawn uh, programs, there was a full explanation on doing top dressing and adding supplements to your turf for your turf beds. Does that help? Yes, that does. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, let's go ahead and continue our program and learn a little bit more about annual bluegrass weevil with Master Gardener Ernie Ruckerto. All right, thank you, Lauren. The, um, the annual bluegrass weevil, uh, Lestronitus macaulicolis, is generally referred to by the acronym ABW. The weevil affects primarily annual bluegrass, Poa annua. Other turf grasses can also be affected, including creeping bent, although the turf grass that is preferred by the weevil is the annual bluegrass. The larvae initially feed from within the bluegrass stem, and as the larvae grow in size, they feed on the crown of the grass, creating severe damage that the plant usually does not recover from. As shown in the second slide here, the annual bluegrass is widely used for golf course fairways and lawn tennis courts. Damage from the weevil was first identified in Connecticut in 1931, and as you'd anticipate, the northeast, northeastern and the mid-Atlantic states are the most effective. As you would, um, the range of the weevil is extending westward though, into Ohio and Wisconsin, and southward into North Carolina, and it encompasses naturally Virginia. The annual bluegrass weevil is very difficult to eradicate. Small adult size are uh, about an eighth, an eighth of an inch long. There are up to three generations of weevil that can be produced in one year, and there are multiple life stages that can be present at one time making treatment more challenging because adults and larvae require different pesticides. Weevils can also become resistant to certain pesticides within a, very, uh, within a few years, um, which is not usually characteristic of uh, pesticide applications. And a study of golf courses in Virginia revealed that some of the weevils have already built up a resistance to insecticides in varying degrees throughout the Commonwealth. The stressed turf grass initially appears as small brown areas where individual plants are damaged. Typically, the spots appear at the edge of the fairways, proximate to the overwintering areas. The larvae cause damage to the turf grass. As the growing season progresses, brown areas increase in size as the larvae progress through the instar stages and additional eggs hatch. It's a major concern for golf courses due to the damage that will be done to the turf grass. The weevil develops through five instars, um, seen in the next uh, slide. Uh, the instars are over on the left side, 
the latter instars are important as due to their size, when they emerge from the leaf sheaths, the, they are then susceptible to larvicides. The adult weevil is shown in the photograph on the right. It's about an eighth of an inch long and has the characteristic weevil or curved weevil snout. Uh, the life cycle of the, uh, the weevil is, um, starts with the adults overwintering in the edges of wooded areas and within the leaf weather in those wooded areas. The adults lay eggs within the leaf or the grass leaf sheaths and the larvae develop through five instars into adult weevils. Some researchers have tracked the development of the bluegrass weevil by correlating growing degree days. Uh, it's shown here as a base 50, which means that's a soil temperature of uh, 50 degrees. And you add the, uh, you cumulatively add the, uh, the temperature um, above 50 degrees to come up with the range in um, what they call growing degree days that are presented in this slide. At about 110 to 120 growing degree days, when the forsythia is approximately half green, half yellow, the adults migrate to low, well-maintained turf grass. At approximately 175 GDDs, the peak, which is the peak of the flowering, or excuse me, uh, which is the, uh, when the dogwood are in full bloom, the adult weevils lay eggs within the leaf sheath. At approximately 350 GDDs, the peak of the flowering of the Catawba rhododendron. The third and fourth instar exit from the crown of the plant and are then susceptible to larvicides. So the GDDs are indicators of when pesticide applications can be made for the adults and for the larva. Testing and sampling can be done and it's important so you can determine the, uh, the quantity of weevil, weevils and the stage of development of the adult and the larva. The quick test is to insert a soil knife in the turf grass pry up some of the side and look at a cross section and do a count of the uh, larvae that are, are observed. Several procedures have been developed by universities and industry groups um, to more accurately assess the quantities of the weevil. Turf plugs or open designated turf areas are used, both which utilize a salt immersion to induce larvae to come to the surface. So basically you would take an area such as a turf plug and you would immerse um, immerse that in a salt solution and water and the salt would cause the larva to come to the surface you do a count. In the open areas, you do the same process just to come up with the count of the number of uh, uh, weevil larva that are there to determine if treatment's required. Based on the foregoing test results, uh, develop a, an effective control plan with your local cooperative extension agent. In general, for adult uh, weevils, Virginia experience shows that uh, pyrethroids are effective, although resistance is quickly developed, and these are also toxic to bees and pollinators. For adult weevils, organophosphate chlorpyrifos is also effective. In general, for larval weevils, Virginia experience shows that insectic or larvicides, fervents, provant, matchpoint, and dursban are effective. But due to the resistance that can develop in, so with certain insecticides, it's important to develop an effective plan that includes rotation of insecticide classes. Again, consult with your local extension agent for assistance. And resources uh, that were used to develop this uh, presentation are presented on, the, uh, on this slide here. So thank you very much for your time and back to you, Lauren. Hi, Ernie, thank you so much. We actually have a question um, that I would like to read to you from our chat box. Okay. It says, I have a lot of annual bluegrass as a weed in my tall fescue lawn. I was planning to apply, um, and this is pedimethylene this fall as a pre-emergent, but is there a way to leverage ABW as a natural suppressant without harming my fescue? That's an interesting question. I haven't uh, come across that approach before, but it, uh, but it would stand to reason that, uh, that you could use the weevils to, uh, to do some damage and to help control your uh, annual bluegrass. That would be an interesting question to uh, um, we can get back to you with regard to uh, a response on that if you'd like, or you could check with your uh, um, 
local extension agent to uh, see if they've come across any approaches or anybody that has experience with that. Thank you. Perfect. Yes, thank you so much for the question and thank you for the answer. We will go ahead and resume our session with a presentation by Master Gardener Roseanne Jones on corn speedwell. Well, good afternoon to everybody. I'm going to be talking about corn speedwell. I'm commonly known as Veronica Arbensis. Um, and some of you may, after this presentation, be going outside and going, oh my gosh, I have it all over my lawn. So let's look at it. It's a winter annual herb. Okay, um, it thrives in the open turf and then goes dormant in cold weather, but resumes its growth in the spring, producing lots of seeds. The seedlings can form these dense masses in the turf and soil. And then as temperatures increase in the late spring and summer, it will die back. Um, we find it in our lawns, our ornamental areas, and then our home gardens. And it's just a low growing succulent. Uh, the leaves, the seedling leaves are a little oval shaped. They have rounded toothed edges with some sparse hair. Then the upper leaves on the plant are smaller and more narrow than the lower ones, but they lack stalks. And the arrangement of them is opposite at the base and then they start alternating as they go up the stalks. On um, the flowers, you'll recognize them because they're small, bright blue or purple. They look lovely in those lawns until you know what they do. They also have a seed pod which is kind of heart-shaped and hairy um, and contains about 14 to 20 of those cute little yellow seeds that get everywhere and start growing more of this weed. So what's the growth pattern? It germinates in the fall with the major growth occurring in late winter and early spring. Um, the Beginning in the fall, it's usually when the, the temperatures are below about 75 degrees for extended periods. And as I mentioned, it's a low growing prostate succulent, so you don't see it very much. Um, it's just kind of hiding there among the uh, turf you've got. It gets to be about, oh, two to six inches tall, but some of it can get up to 14 inches if you let it. Um, what kind of soil does it like? Hmm. Well, it prefers a dry, sandy soil, but if you have increased moisture and shade, these can contribute to invasion. If you have thin turf areas, then it becomes kind of more favorable to it. How do we control it? Well, using those good lawn care practices that we talk a lot about in our lunch and lawn programs, um, getting the right uh, turf for your uh, soil type, getting a soil test, mowing um, at about three to four inches. Don't mow low, okay? That's, or that's one of the big things that we promote. Um, also, fertilize as necessary. These are important things to remember. Um, also, when you mow, use a mulcher um, so that you, what that does is it allows that cut grass to create a barrier so that the seeds then can't germinate in the open turf or the open dirt. Mechanically, hand pulling, that's the best method. Uh, I know myself, I've been out there on a daily basis, uh, particularly after the rain when it's easier to pull that out. At least if you can't get the whole plant, get the, uh, the seed heads and the flowers out of there. Um, as far as your ornamental gardens go, um, if you plant dense, and use organic mulching, that's gonna help a lot as far as deterring any establishment of those weeds. So how about chemical control? Um, herbicides, use them as a last resort. Think about the environment. Um, it's best just to spot treat those with a liquid selective post-emergent weed killer when weeds are actively growing, but always be sure to read the labels. Um, you can refer to the, the VCE pest management guide. I know they're going to put a link on the, uh, the chat for you. Um, as far as the pre-emergence and lawns, you want to apply them late summer, early fall. But keep in mind, you want to 
um, time that uh, application around your um, overseeding if you're doing any, because if you put a, a pre emergent down, any seeds, grass seeds that you've overseeded are not going to emerge. So you want to give some time span between the two. Um, you can also refer to the table 5.6 in the pest management guide for recommended herbicide active ingredients. Um, as far as post emergence in the lawns, again, apply them to the actively growing weeds. That's when they're young. Get them, get them while they're young, as they say, right? Refer to table 5.8 and 5.9 for the recommended herbicide active ingredients for post emergence. And as far as your gardens go with the ornamentals, those are a little bit more particular. So we have some different table numbers for those uh, for both the pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicide active ingredients. Most of the time though, in your gardens, you can use the, the hand pull method because you usually don't get that many. Um, I've given some examples of some of these herbicides, um, but again, refer to the pest management guide or you can talk to your local um, garden center personnel who should be very knowledgeable in that. All right, and here's some of the resources I used. So hopefully it will be helpful for you as you go out and you look at your lawn and say, oh my goodness, I think I have some corn fed speed well, let me get it out of there. All right, back to you, Lauren, thank you. All right, that was perfect, Roseanne. Thank you so very much.